everyone, welcome back to Alice in the Giant Bookshelf. My name's Alice and today we're going to be talking about how I'm getting on with the 1900 to 1950 readathon. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome back to Alice and the Giant Bookshelf. We've just passed the halfway point in May, so I thought it was time to update you on how I'm getting on with my TBR and what progress has been made. First of all, I need to confess two mistakes in my original TBR video. Just after I'd mentioned that I had 216 books left to read on my giant TBR, I picked up my copy of The Wasteland and other poems ready to read it and realised it wasn't actually on that list of 216 books. 217 books including this one. But I've read it now so we're back under control. On the TBR video I mentioned Dorothy L Sayers and I showed you this book Unnatural Death. When I looked into it it turned out this was actually the third book in the series so if I do get round to Dorothy L Sayers this month I'm actually going to read Clouds of Witness instead because it's the second book and I prefer to read them in order if I can. Excuse the cat ears, my cat is trying to direct the video today. So let's get started on how I'm getting on with the reading. The first thing I actually read for the 1900 to 1950 readathon was The Wastelands and Other Poems by T.S. Eliot. I actually really enjoyed this poetry collection. The first poem in the book was The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock which I've never read before, but I did really enjoy it. I had the first line, let us go then you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, stuck in my head for quite a while. So I enjoyed that one. It had been quite a long time since I read a book of poetry, so it was really enjoyable to read some poems again. I thought The Wasteland itself was probably my second favorite in the collection. I don't think I really understood all of it, but Having spoken to my mum about it, she said like, almost nobody ever fully understands the wasteland, so that's good. It really feels like a stream of consciousness, like a really crazy stream of consciousness. I felt like I was reading the entire contents of T.S. Eliot's brain um, with random thoughts coming into it at all times. It's certainly a very interesting read, very odd, but there are some really good lines in it, some really powerful imagery. It was a really interesting poetry collection, I enjoyed the whole thing. Yeah, it's, it's a very powerful poem. I would definitely read this again and I would recommend reading it if you like poetry and you like reading really odd things, um, give it a try. This was the second book I finished, A Farewell to Arms by Ernest Hemingway. I was quite surprised by it. I haven't read any Hemingway before. I thought it was going to be very First World War driven. And it is. It's set in the First World War and the protagonist is in Italy serving with the ambulance service. So in A Farewell to Arms, the hero of the story is wounded like quite quickly. He's not really, hasn't really done any fighting in that time. He just gets blown up. Not even while fighting, he gets blown up while he's sitting eating with some amb other ambulance drivers. And he goes to a hospital and ends up falling in love with one of the nurses there. Most of the story then really revolved around their story. I'd like to say this was a love story, but it wasn't wasn't a love story like any love story I've ever read. Again, I suppose this is kind of stream of consciousness type writing. At first it took a bit of getting used to because there was a lot of long sentences joined together with and, and, and. When the protagonist is drinking his stream of consciousness gets even more disjointed which I suppose was quite a good technique. I've decided to give Hemingway the benefit of the doubt and decide that this is a conscious narrative choice and not just bad writing. <laughs> So I'm sure he is a good writer, as he said to be, but I didn't particularly enjoy this book. I kind of carried on with it, reading it, thinking that something major was about to happen at every turn, and it didn't really. I am glad that the readathon caused me to read this book because I don't think I ever would have read it if it wasn't for the readathon. So I'm glad I've read it. I wouldn't read it again. 
My main problem was I didn't really care about either of the two characters in the love story. It, it's very realistic. I'm not sure how much of this was autobiographical and how much of it wasn't, but you can tell that Hemingway has really had a lot of these experiences. We hear sort of everything that he's eaten and everything that he's drunk on every page. Please let me know in the comments down below whether I should read another Hemingway and if so, which Hemingway should I read because I found this book to be very strange indeed and I don't know whether to give Hemingway another try. In the meantime, while I was reading A Farewell to Arms, I was also listening to the audiobook of Animal Farm. I mentioned in another video how much I love listening to audiobooks narrated by Stephen Fry. I think he really injects them with enthusiasm and has a great voice for reading to you. I found Animal Farm really enjoyable and Stephen Fry did great voices for all the animals. I keep having the, the mantra of the animals, four legs good, two legs bad in my head. I love the sort of cyclical nature of the plot and the portrait it gives us of sort of di dictatorships and propaganda revolutions. It was funny in places. It was my first George Orwell book and it was a really enjoyable listen. Sadly, I can't say the same for my current listen, which is 1984 by George Orwell, which I got together in the same collection. Again, read by Stephen Fry, but this time I'm not really enjoying it. I'm finding it very monotonous. I normally like dystopian fiction and I really thought that 1984 was going to be an absolute classic. I think I've got a couple of hours left of it to listen to. It has got a bit better, but I haven't really enjoyed it. So differing fates for my first two experiences of George Orwell. I loved Animal Farm. Not finding 1984 quite so exciting, although it is interesting. After I'd finished A Farewell to Arms, I decided I definitely needed something really positive and enjoyable. And I decided to go with one of my children's books for the month. I actually put this to the vote on Instagram and asked people to vote between The Wind in the Willows and Anne of Green Gables. And Anne of Green Gables came out top. So I read Anne of Green Gables next. If you've watched my TBR video for this readathon, you will know that this was the book that I wasn't particularly looking forward to for the month. I thought I might not get to it. But ever since putting out that video, most of what everybody has said to me has been, oh, I love Anne of Green Gables. And in the face of the overwhelming positivity and the vote, I decided to read it. I read this over the course of a weekend. I have to say, I'm totally converted. I really enjoyed Anne of Green Gables. It was a much needed, happy antidote for after Farewell to Arms. I really liked the character of Anne. I liked her immediately, even though she could be a bit annoying at times. I just really enjoyed following all of her different adventures. I was rooting for her to start liking Gilbert even though they obviously had quite a dislike of each other from the very beginning. I absolutely loved the Cuthberts as characters as well. They're really, they're really well written. The way Matthew immediately likes Anne's charms and the way she talks so much and the softening of Marilla over time towards Anne. It's just a really lovely story. I laughed in places and I really, really cried at the end. So this book had a bit of everything for me. It's definitely something I would have really enjoyed when I was a lot younger. I've even watched the first couple of episodes on Netflix of Anne with an E now, and I think I will carry on watching that. So yeah, I had a really good time with Anne of Green Gables. I would recommend it to people, especially if you like sort of children's stories where funny things happen to the main character. Really good read. I'm pleasantly surprised by this and again it's something I almost certainly wouldn't have read for a very long time if it wasn't for the 1900 to 1950 readathon. So well done readathon for getting me to read this book. The next book I read was Sweet Danger by Marjorie Allingham. This was the only book I could find on my shelves that was published in the 1930s. I was looking forward to it because it was a crime classic and I really like classic crime. 
I'd really liked Marjorie Allingham's other book, The Tiger in the Smoke, which I think is one of her most famous. This was only the second of her books that I'd read. I didn't really like Sweet Danger. There was some, some crazy sort of side storylines that seemed quite unnecessary to the actual plot. The actual plot itself I didn't find very interesting. It was about trying to find a lost European crown. It, it just really wasn't for me. It's only 250 pages. I really struggled with at least the first 100, maybe more. There's a really random part in the middle where the main character is supposedly sent away and that was very, very strange indeed. If you were going to read a Marjorie Allingham, I would definitely recommend The Tiger in the Smoke over this. I might unhaul this but I am quite attached to the classic Penguin Crime covers and I only own about three of these, including this one, so I might keep it, but then again, I might unhaul it. So, not sure. I certainly won't be reading it again. It's a very bizarre book. All of the action of this book seemed to take place in the last 50 pages when it was absolutely madly boom, 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 action. Uh, the rest of the book, virtually nothing happens in my opinion so yeah wasn't keen on this one which brings me up to what i'm currently reading which is my agatha christie for the month but it's a bit of an agatha christie with a difference because it's by mary westmacott which is the pseudonym agatha christie used to write non-crime books this was my first ever Mary Westmacott. It's the only one that I own. I'm really enjoying this. Part of me sort of wishes that I didn't know this was Agatha Christie writing it because I'd like to see if I could tell that it's her or if there's any clues that it's her um, if I didn't know. As it is, I feel like there are certain elements of her style that are definitely creeping in, into this book. I can certainly recognise elements, particularly from her more thrillerish novels. It's definitely some style elements in common. I'm really enjoying this. It had a very intriguing beginning with the narrator being called to a dying man's bedside. He then basically tells us he's going to tell the story of why he why he absolutely hates this <laughs> a man who's dying at the beginning and what happened between them. He then goes back into the past to tell us what happened between him and John Gabriel. Really loving this book. I probably will finish this today. It's It's been a really enjoyable read. Very different from Agatha Christie's usual, but she's definitely showing herself to be a really good writer, whatever it is she's writing about. So really, really enjoying my current read. After I've read that, I'm not sure what to go on to next. While setting up the video, I did pick up A Little Princess, which I would really like to read. I definitely would still really like to get to The Wind in the Willows. So that's two children's ones. And the rest of what's left on my pile is my little selection of classic crime. So I'll see if I get to any of those. Also, I did mention that in order to read something from every decade, I was going to need to get something from the 1910s. I mentioned that I already had an ebook of The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Last week, for the first time in over a year, I actually went to the library and I was so thrilled to be there. I didn't want to get any books that would distract me from reading my giant TBR, but I did have a quick look to see if they had The Lost World and they did. So. I am really happy with this because I'm not very good at reading ebooks. So I might actually read The Lost World next because I think the 1910s is the only decade I still haven't read something from. So really excited about this one. It says it's a 3D cover and that the glasses are included, but sadly because it's from the library there are no 3D glasses, so I'm not sure how cool this dinosaur might look if you had some 3D glasses. I have downloaded an audiobook which also could count as being from the 1910s. That is The Jeeves Collection by P.G. Woodhouse. I've never read any of the Jeeves and Wooster books uh, and I've heard really good things about P.G. Woodhouse. So when I finish 1984 on audiobook, I will definitely be starting The Jeeves Collection and I'm quite excited about it. So I 
think I've got the 1910s covered now. Yeah, so I think the month's going really well. Thanks for joining me in my update of how my month of May is going for reading. I hope you'll check out Katie from Books and Things channel as she is kindly hosting this 1900 to 1950 readathon. You can find the link in the description down below. I'll also link my own TBR video. I hope you enjoyed my mini wrap up. We're halfway through the 1900 to 1950 readathon. I'm really enjoying myself, even though some of the books haven't been my favourites. Please give the video a like if you enjoyed it and consider subscribing if you haven't already. And I hope you'll join me again soon for another video all about books on Alice in the Giant Bookshelf. Bye for now.